At the most basic level, a railway horizontal alignment design is a series of straights connected by curves. But in this video, we're concerned about the connection between the two of them, the transition. So why do we need transitions? Well, let's start by looking at the characteristics of both straights and curves. A straight is, well, straight. It will also normally have no cant applied to it, so it's flat with both rails at the same height. A curve has a constant radius and cant applied to manage the forces and ride comfort. So we have flat straight track going to curved track with cant on it. The change between the two cannot happen instantly. For one, it would mean you'd have to have a sharp twist in the track, which could derail the train. And imagine how uncomfortable it would be if the train did manage to stay on the tracks. This is where the transition curve comes in. A transition curve is used to introduce, then decrease the radius from a straight to the designed curve radius, while also building up from zero mil to the required cant level. But how's this done? Let's put on our geometry hats. A transition curve is in fact what is known as a clothoid, which is a type of spiral. A clothoid spiral tightens uniformly along the length, meaning there is a proportional link between the radius and its length. This continual variation of curvature ensures a smooth transition for the trains. The gradual tightening of the curve also leads to a gradual increase in cant. The level of cant is linked to both the curve radius and the line speed via this equation. For more on cant, please check out my video, The Complete Guides Railway Cant, linked at the top right now and in the description below. As the line speed, V, is constant, but the radius is changing, so must the level of cant. As the radius varies along the length of the transition, so does the cant, until it reaches the level required for the curve the transition is connected to. But what governs how fast the cant can be increased? Introduced too quickly, and it would be no better for trains and their passengers than an instant change. This is the length of the transition. The shorter the transition, the quicker the radius and the cant have to change. The length of the transition is ultimately governed by the increase in cant for passenger comfort. This is through the rate at which it changes, expressed in millimetres per second. The UK railway standards put a limit on the rate of change of cant as well as the rate of change of cant deficiency. This is because cant and cant deficiency are linked through equilibrium cant. Remember, if this is not something you've come across, check out my video on cant. The standard gives three values, normal, maximum, and exceptional. The normal value should be considered the limit for the majority of instances. The maximum value is an upper limit that while not non-compliant is considered non-preferable. It should be used when the design is constrained or limited in some way. The rate of change of can also has an exceptional limit. This is for, you guessed it, exceptional circumstances and requires agreement with key stakeholders before use. So let's see these values. So how do we use these values? There are two main approaches. Firstly, you can pick a length of transition, then calculate the rates of change and check them against the standard. This would be the way you would likely approach it if you were checking a design. But if you're a designer and you don't want to have to go through the trial and error of picking different transition lengths, what do you do? You can use the normal values to determine an ideal or desirable length or use the maximum values to determine the shortest transition you can use. So let's look at the equations that are the key to all of this. Nicely for us, the form is the same for both the rate of change of cant and cant deficiency. It's important to note here that this is applied cant that is used, not the equilibrium cant. This is why the cant deficiency is checked as well. So we have the length is equal to the change in cant multiplied by the line speed divided by 3.6 times the rate of change of cant. For cant deficiency, simply sub the change in deficiency and the rate of change values in. This equation is based on metric measurements, therefore the cant will be in millimetres while the line speed needs to be in kilometres per hour. Shall we do an example to walk through the process? For this, we'll imagine we're a designer, so we want to find the ideal and the shortest length transition. The transition we are looking at will be between a section of straight track and a curve. The curve has a 1000 metre radius with 110 millimetre cant applied to it. The cant deficiency is 60.64. This is the equilibrium cant minus the applied cant. The equilibrium cant is calculated with the equation shown now. The straight has 0 mil cant. Lastly, the line speed is 120 kilometres an hour, around 75 miles an hour. So now we know the two elements we are linking, let's look at the transition. 
First, we will look at the ideal length of the transition. For this, we need our normal design values. Remember, we have to do the calculation for both the cant and the cant deficiency. Given these equations are so similar, we will look at the rate of change of cant first in a bit more detail, then summarise the cant deficiency. So here is our equation. So let's sub in our values. On the left, we have our cant value. Remember, we're going from 0 mil cant in the straight to 110 mm cant in the curve. So the change is 110 mm. Our speed is 120, while our normal value for the rate of change of cant is 35 mm per second. This gives us an L value of 104.76 meters. Do the same for the cant deficiency. The numbers are all the same apart from our change in cant deficiency, which is 60.64. This gives 57.75 meters as our L value. So now we have two values for L. We need to take the longer of the two to meet the desirable limits. This is because the shorter length, the 57.75 meter length, is calculated for the rate of change of deficiency, which would mean the rate of change of can is, that is higher than the normal or desirable limit. So our desirable length for this transition is 104.76 meters. Now let's rerun the calculations, but with the maximum values. This gives us the shortest length the designer can go to while remaining compliant. The process is the same, but the rate of change values are those stated for the maximum. Again, this is nice and easy as they're both 55 millimeters per second. So let's sub in our values for cant, and this gives us 66.6 meters. And then for cant deficiency, we look again at the equation with 55 millimeters per second, and this gives us a length of 36.76. Again, if we review the two calculated lengths, we can see that we need to take the longer one, as we did earlier. This gives us a minimum length of 66.6 metres. So this gives us, as the designer, some key values to work with. It's important to remember that although we have calculated what we have called the ideal value, the transition can be longer than this. This will have rates of change that are lower than the limits stated in the standard, which is not an issue. So ideally, our transition should be no shorter than 104.76 metres, but it can be as low as 66.6 metres, if needed. This could be for a number of reasons, such as constrained sight or tying into an existing section of track. So now you know how to design a transition between a straight and a curve, but not all track is that simple when it comes to its geometry. How do we approach the design of a transition where there are two curves back to back? And what about if they're curving different ways? These are known as compound and reverse curves. A compound curve is two curves in series that are curving or handed the same way. They will have different radii, therefore could have different cant or cant deficiency values, and they are linked by a single transition. A reverse curve is two curves in series, but with different handing. Again, they can have different radii, but they could be the same given the direction change. Within a reverse curve, the rail the cant is applied to, the rail lifted higher, changes as the direction of the curve changes. This is important for when we calculate the change in cant later. Given the cant is changing rail, there needs to be a point where there is zero cant. This is known as the reverse point. Between each curve and the reverse point is a transition. So there are two transitions. Let's go back to the compound curve first. The main difference we have between a compound curve and the straight to curve example we looked at earlier is where the straight had no cant, the curve is likely to have cant applied. So let's take our equation. In this instance, the rate of change of cant equation. In the prior example, the change in cant, delta E, was the cant value of the curve. This is because the straight had zero cant. Now we need to work out our change in cant between the two curves. So delta E becomes E2 minus E1, where E2 and E1 are the cants on each curve. This is the same for delta D in our other equation, so relatively simple. Now let's look at the reverse curve. As we said earlier, the cant on the reverse curve changes rail. On the left-hand curve, the right-hand rail will be higher. On the right-hand curve, the left-hand rail will be higher. At the reverse point in the middle, the track will be flat, so there will be no cant applied. To transition from the cant on the left-hand curve to that of the right-hand curve, the cant needs to be removed, go through a flat or zero cant section, and then build back up to that of the right-hand curve. To find the difference, we need to add the cant values together, as they are on different rails. Mathematically, if we say our first curve has positive cant and the second has negative cant, E1 minus minus E2 
equals e1 plus e2. So if we put this into our equation, we get the length equals the two cant values added together, multiplied by the line speed, divided by 3.6, multiplied by the rate of change of cant. Again, this works the same for the cant deficiency values. Other than those tweaks to the equation, the process is the same. So now you can look to design transitions between a straight and a curve, in a compound curve, and at a reverse curve. I hope you found this video useful and informative. If you have, please give that like button a click. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to get all the latest videos and support the channel. Thank you.